I'm Fred Scheich, I'm with IFARA, and we're here at the 22nd Croix with Karina Butler. And uh, she is from Ireland, and I'm going to let her describe her study and first give your affiliation so we know where you're from. Okay, I am presenting the study today on behalf of the Penta uh, Network Group, and I'm based in Our Lady's Children's Hospital in Dublin in Ireland. And the study is called the Breather Study. The Breather Study, yes, we presented that today. And basically, Breather is a strategy, strategy study that looked at the feasibility of short cycle therapy, that is five days on, two days off, compared with continuous therapy for young people who were stably suppressed on their antiviral medication using a favorance-based therapy. So we looked at young people who were aged 8 to 24 years of age, who were a very selective group in that they had records of excellent adherence, they had never had virologic failure, and they um, could have had PMTC drugs or they could have been on, stable on a PI and switched to efavirenz, but they were virologically suppressed and then they were randomized to either continue their treatment as of standard seven days a week or to go on a five-day week with the two days off, usually at weekends, but sometimes other two days if there was specific need. And we looked to see, our main um, aim was to see whether we maintained the same virologic suppression in those who were on the short cycle therapy compared with those who were on continuous therapy. And uh, we also looked at a range of other parameters because we wanted to make sure that there were no other indicators, even if viral load remained suppressed, that there was any harm or adverse consequences to the strategy. Mm -hmm. So we looked at CD4 counts, we looked at emergence of resistance, and a range of biomarkers in a sub-study to look at any markers of inflammation. Did you evaluate the level of, in the blood of the drug? That was one thing that has not been done mm -hmm. to date. Um, but that's something that might be done in the future. You, you, um, you could, do you have stored blood? Because or, or, there, are, yeah. there is stored blood, but okay. that has not been done. Basically, uh, we were looking at the primary endpoint, which was viral load suppression to less than 50 copies per mil. Mm -hmm. And how is this different, because I think you alluded to that in the press conference, than what we've been doing in the past? Well, in the past, there were a number of different treatment interruption trials. And, of course, they all really stopped after the SMART study data came out because there were concerns that the inflammation led to adverse consequences and in fact unanticipated adverse consequences in terms of cardiovascular events and that. But those all had a different principle because what they did was they allowed CD4 counts drift down in some but they allowed viral rebound. Mm -hmm. Whereas this study was different in its concept it was about exploiting the properties of certain long-acting drugs that would stay in the blood throughout that period so that viral suppression would not be lost. Mm -hmm. So in a way, although it was taking a break from taking your pills every day, it was about... You weren't really off treatment. You really weren't off treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between this and other treatment interruption studies. So it was really just a short cycle therapy, but treatment was there the whole time. Now, the important thing here from a practical standpoint is to not jump to conclusions and to, and to say, okay, yeah, it's been done. But, the, you know, but it has been done. And, and there are people who are, as some of the people in the press conference were mentioning, um, actually might already be taking without you know, a breather or a holiday, as some said, um, off treatment or off taking the treatment, I should say, not off treatment. But that they don't tell their doctor. Yeah. So, uh, in reality, we really know, need to know this information. Yeah. Now that we do, um, if there is this sense of, of otherwise adherence, then it seems like a reasonable thing, but how would you move forward from here? How do we get established to the point where doctors really feel comfortable in, uh, I mean, they can prescribe this, I guess, could they not? I mean, it's an individualized thing. Well, they can, but I think um, you're absolutely right when you say that people, some people have been doing this of their own accord, mm -hmm. but we really didn't know what the consequences of that were. So it was very important mm -hmm. to find out, not only for efavirenz, but maybe for drugs in the future that have long half-lights that might be exploited in this way. Mm -hmm. And I think it was important that we look not just at viral load, but that we look beyond that, particularly in terms of what the inflammatory changes might be. Because we, we've been evaluating that, and it sometimes is not consistent. It's not yes. coordinated with the, with the other markers. The markers are not necessarily coordinated. 
But we also have to look at it over a longer period of time because mm -hmm. this study, although the results are very consistent and very re robust, it really only extended to 48 weeks. Now, some, the median follow-up was over 80 weeks, mm -hmm. but we have 48 data on everybody. Mm -hmm. The children who are randomized, most of them have actually continued, have enrolled in a long-term follow-up study mm -hmm which will go on for two years, and that will consolidate the data mm -hmm, that yeah. we have. And then I think we have to remember that this still is only a relatively small number of very selected individuals, mm -hmm. 299 mm -hmm. were enrolled. We're very otherwise compliant. We're otherwise mm -hmm. very compliant. Mm -hmm. And some of the feedback we got back from the participants themselves was very important because what did come out was yes, sometimes they did take breaks that they didn't tell people about. Mm -hmm. but that before when they, they went on the study. It, before they went on the study. But when they were on this study, what they felt was then they felt that they knew they had to be adherent for the other five days a week because they knew they were being allowed those two days off. So one of the benefits we thought we might see is that adherence overall might actually improve. Mm. And the other thing that the young people uh, said was they didn't feel that it was necessarily going to be suitable for everybody. Mm -hmm. We certainly aren't ready for it to go into guidelines at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, on an individual basis, if somebody is doing it, it might give the clinicians some reassurance, but it can really only be done where there is virological monitoring. Mm -hmm. So individually, some people may elect to do it. The data we have so far is robust, but it's quite limited. We need to extend that data set and consolidate what we have so far. So er essentially everybody that was on the five days on and two days off, it made no difference. It, it made, made no, no difference. difference. So In the parameters that we looked at, we looked at viral load to less than 50 copies, and there were the same number of events. There were six in the um, short cycle therapy arm and seven in the continuous therapy mm -hmm. arm. So there was the, the difference in probability of failing was 1.2%, but actually in favor of the short cycle therapy, mm -hmm. but no overall difference really. In terms of CD4 counts, there were no difference, um, or in terms of the biomarkers, a range of 19 different biomarkers, there was no difference. The only almost difference, borderline significance, was in D-dimers, and that was in favor of short cycle therapy. How, how many uh, immune, immune biomarkers were there? There was a panel of 19 looked at. Wow, yeah. I'd love to look at I that. I couldn't list them all, but well, No, but I mean, later, I would yeah. love to look at that, yes. because I've, I've not known that many. And, yeah. uh, there were 19. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Julia Kenny carried out the sub-study, hmm. and uh, as you say, with that extensive panel, there was I've never no heard difference. of that. I honestly, I've never heard of that many biomarkers, but all immune biomarkers. Yes, okay. yes. But in addition to other, beyond, uh, there weren't, weren't just biomarkers uh, in immune, it was... Well, it was looking at various uh, interleukins, right, high, yeah. high sensitivity yeah. CRP, D-dimers, mm -hmm. a range of markers of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you find is the next step is, uh, well, obviously you're continuing this. Well, the next step is very definitely the long-term follow-up. Right. And uh, fortunately, most of the people enrolled are, were happy to re-enroll and continue because mm -hmm. they, I think they understood the importance of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think two years hence, we will have the results from that. Mm -hmm. And then the question is really whether larger trials with this type of strategy need to be thought of in order to get even more robust results. If you had to, the ability to, or if you, if you wanted to change, if you had to do it over again, how would you have changed the, the design of the trial? Is there something you missed or you feel you might have missed? Uh, in terms of the design of the trial, I, this trial was quite long in gestation. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was really trying to refine it down because initially we weren't as focused in on the idea of ensuring that there was viral suppression. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think those, that thoughtfulness went into it at the time. Um, what do we not know? We don't know retrospectively how long the duration of suppression was before children entered the study. We do know that they were suppressed for more than 12 months, but we don't know how long they had been suppressed. Whether mm -hmm. that would make a difference, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, but that's retrospective data. Um, we don't know. Th the only thing that was different in the two groups entering the study was that there was a difference in the um, 
number of CDCC events at baseline, and there were slightly more of those in the continuous therapy arm than in the uh, short cycle therapy arm. Mm -hmm. So we, we know that there was absolutely no difference in CD4 count at time of entry to study, but we don't know um, what the CD4 count nadir was before that as to whether mm -hmm. there was any difference in the mm -hmm. population there. But I think there isn't anything that I would change about this study. Mm -hmm. um, there were modifications made during the course of it to extend the number of people enrolled so that the data would be as robust as we could and to extend um, now to extend the period of follow-up. So uh, are you going to be pursuing any other trials that may be similar to this? Uh, well, I think at this stage we're focusing on the um, follow length of follow-up. Yeah. And then I think one of the other considerations now in the study is to think about the results of the Encore study and efavirenz dosing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that came out from this study uh, from the young people was that they realized that when they had their weekend break, that they were sometimes feeling much better mm -hmm. and that there were, if you like, unreported or undisclosed side effects, unrecognized side effects mm -hmm. to efavirenz. Mm -hmm. um, Encore has yeah. looked at a yeah. uh, lower dose of uh, uh, efavirenz, right. but um, whether that gives that same freedom, maybe it's better to take your efavirenz in five days uh, at the higher dose rather than at the lower dose over seven mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Those are things that need to be thought about. Right. What, what were the, uh, do you have any standard um, combos that were offered? Is it just a Favarens plus? It was a Favarens plus two NRTIs and that yeah. depended on the um, centers. So at the beginning there were quite a lot of children who were on uh, Zydovidin and 3TC from the African centers. Mm -hmm. From the European centers it would have been more Abacavir and 3TC. There's no difference that we could see by nucleoside backbone so far. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they were allowed to switch uh, if there was some, did any switch? Or? Uh, there were changes in... But they have uh, to stay with the efavirenz. Uh, yeah. There were changes if they met the primary endpoint. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, short cycle therapy arm, there were, I'm trying to uh, recall now, uh, there were six who met the primary endpoint. They all went back on to continuous therapy. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there were, actually it was 90%, I think, were on the same regimen at the end of the study versus 88% in the continuous therapy arm. It was higher mm -hmm. than that in the uh, short cycle therapy mm -hmm. arm. More children were on the same regimen, mm -hmm. over 90% at the end of the study. What were the, the uh, one end or the other, the range of age? In the the uh, enrollment, they were allowed uh, to enroll from eight years of age up to 24 years of age. Mm -hmm. The median age was 14. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting in terms of the generalizability of this approach that a fifth or 21% were over 18 years. So this really mm -hmm. was also a study that would be applicable to young adults. It wasn't just about children. Mm -hmm. But we thought it was important to include it down to the younger ages because I said this was about trying to normalize the experience for young people who are mm -hmm. coping with HIV infection. And because of the stigma and secrecy around medications, young, younger children, sort of nine and 10, when you're beginning to go on sleepovers, parents weren't willing to let them do that or would curtail them even from holidays or school trips because they didn't want to disclose that the child had to take medications. Mm -hmm. So we extended it down to that age group and then in adolescence, it was more about them going out at the weekends, to be honest, when mm -hmm. they either wouldn't take or forgot their medications mm -hmm. or didn't want to be bringing it with them. Mm -hmm. Did you follow up with any um, safer sex practices or anything like that? Or? Uh, well, all of the children as part of the routine and in our clinic, and certainly many, would have counseling in that regard. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, however, to note that although that was part of it and children were supposed, to, or young people were supposed to be um, adhering to contraceptive me measures, there were a number of pregnancies during the study. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There were uh, one in the, uh, con in the short cycle therapy arm, mm -hmm. and I think it was five, four or five in the uh, continuous therapy arm. So what do you think, um, did you do any social interactions other than the, uh, yes. the counselling? No, the, one of the very important aspects of this study, like in designing the study, we thought this is what young people would like, this is going to impact their quality of life. But one of the things that was apparent was that it was actually really important to try and assess that in a more detailed way. So in parallel, there's a qualitative sub-study carried out by uh, Dr. Sarah Benazenal, which is still ongoing, which carried out in-depth interviews with um, a number of the young people before the study, 
during the study and now after the study and after the dissemination of the results mm -hmm. to get their assessment. And that really has, will be a mine of information mm -hmm. in terms of whether this really impacts on their lives or not. As part of the main study, we had acceptability questionnaires looking at what young people found difficult or what they thought would be easier. And we found that most of those parameters at the end of the study, they felt those things were better than at the beginning, but only one kind of reached statistical significance, and that was going out with friends on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So overall, children liked it, young people liked it, um, and even more liked it at the end of study than at the beginning of the study. Do you suppose even in the social aspects uh, as well, uh, or maybe more specifically, do you suppose there's more data to be uh, evaluated? Oh, and, absolutely, uh, because the results of those uh, interviews and their analysis will be very important. Mm -hmm. and, and it may be, and maybe you can segregate it by age group, because you're older will probably be very similar to any 20, 30 year old. Well, and absolutely, because the older group are essentially young adults. You mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that was interesting that maybe we had anticipated before the study was that we might see very marked differences by geographic region, because this was a study that had young people enrolled in Uganda, in Thailand, in Argentina, in the in, um, US, and in Northern Europe. So you would think that there, culturally there were major differences and that we might get different messages. But in fact, what's amazing is the uniformity of experience of the young person in dealing with this. The whole world is homogenized. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, well, and the young, the young world. And the young the, world yeah, is. Yeah. And uh, the, the concerns and their anxieties are the same, whether they're in Thailand or Uganda mm -hmm. or in the US. I'm beginning to see that when we have these uh, scholarship recipients. Yeah. They have very similar views. In fact, I'm almost to the point where I don't want to separate the panels out by geographic region anymore yeah. because they're, they're so similar in their, their thoughts and their lives. But I guess because of the internet, it just seems to be blended everyone together. But in the history of sort of HIV and the development of HIV therapies, it's sort of been littered by situations where we maybe anticipated that there would be differences like going back to the beginning when we thought, oh, A or V rollout in Africa, you I won't know, get adherence. Say, yeah, I mean, yeah. we've learned... They don't have clocks and... You know, <laughs> don't have we've learned so many lessons. Okay. I mean, we have to have a lot of humility yeah. in going along this road yeah. because really what we recognize they is people are us. the same yeah. everywhere. We have the same concerns. Yeah. So uh, what did you think of some of the other presentations on the, on the panel today and on the, uh, on the uh, press conference? I thought it was a very interesting uh, session this morning, um, and now I have to put my brain in gear and think back, but there were a lot of interesting, of course, the whole issue of what are the best treatments to prevent um, perinatal transmission mm -hmm. uh, in terms of triple therapy, having the advantage over uh, Less, uh, single therapy or single therapy plus single dose nevirapine and tails, you get lower transmission rates. But then there's sort of the caveat that we have to be careful about what the drugs we're using and we need more attention to detail. A little question about the tenofovir in that regard as to whether we need to be watching that spot. Is there going to be more problems to emerge or will that just be a minor mm -hmm. aberration? So I thought that was extremely interesting. Um, I thought Dr. Kenny's presentation on the um, intimal thickness and the tendency to atherosclerosis in such young children when she was doing the uh, carotid ultrasounds and difference is really, again, brings back the message to us that we really need to be treating early mm -hmm. to prevent these kind of subtle changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that's something we should have incorporated in our study in terms of mm -hmm. the long-term follow-up, not you something can always that nest, nest something in there that uh, you might learn something else. In the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, those were um, both, uh, a lot of thought-provoking work came out from this morning. I thought it was really mm -hmm. very full of interesting ideas. You're very gracious to show up here for me today and at such short notice, and uh, that's pretty much the way it works here okay. at the Croix. It's, it's over in a flash. It seems yeah. like it lasted a year, but on the other score, it seems like it happened like quick, oh, yeah. depending upon how you're looking at it. But mm -hmm. we'll all be worn out by the end of the Croix. Absolutely. Well, listen, <laughs> thank you, so thank you much. very much. Right. Thank you.